Hello everyone, we're going to get started now. Welcome to LD at School's second of four webinars for the 2014-2015 year. My name is Amy Gorecki and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Funding for the production of this webinar was provided by the Ministry of Education. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are the views of the recipient and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ministry of Education. The LD at School team is very pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Daniel Ansari, who will be speaking to us this afternoon about understanding developmental dyscalculia, a math learning disability. Just to let everyone know, all webinar participants, except for the presenter, have now been muted for the remainder of the presentation. Once Dr. Ansari has finished his presentation, we will be opening up the floor for questions. Over the course of the presentation, if you would like to ask any of the LD at School team a question, you may enter your text in the box at the bottom of the control panel and choose to send it to the staff from the drop-down menu underneath. After the webinar, we will be sending out presentation slides as well as a link to a survey to provide us with feedback on the webinar. In approximately three weeks, the webinar recording will be available and we will send out a link to all participants. That takes care of all of our housekeeping for this afternoon, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Daniel Ansari. Dr. Ansari is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience in the Department of Psychology at Western University, where he heads the Numerical Cognition Laboratory. Dr. Ansari and his team explore the developmental trajectory underlying both the typical and atypical development of mathematical skills. Dr. Ansari has received the Early Career Contributions Award from the Society for Research and Child Development and the Boyd McCandless Early Researcher Award from the American Psychological Association. In 2014, Dr. Ansari was named a member of the inaugural cohort of the College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists of the Royal Society of Canada. Welcome, Dr. Ansari. The cyber floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today um, and uh, to be able to share some of our insights into developmental dyscalculia with you. Um, before I get started, I wanted to ask the audience a poll question, so we can launch that poll question now, which is, how important do you think math skills are for educational and life success, and please indicate so on a scale from one to four, with one being not very important at all, and four being very important. So if you could respond now, that would be great. And submit your scores, and then we can go ahead and, uh, and close the, uh, the poll. Okay. Well, 68% of you think it's very important, 29% think it's important, and only 3% think it's somewhat important. Well, I want to start my presentation by showing you the, some data that indicates that math skills are indeed extremely important, not just for educational, but also for life success. So here are some uh, statistics to address this question of how important are math skills. Binner and Parson in 2005 in a report in the UK found that low numeracy is associated with the probability of negative outcomes such as unemployment, physical illness, depression, and even incarceration. In other words, there's a correlation between individuals' numeracy abilities and these negative life outcomes. Relatedly, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that uh, publishes this program for international student assessment or the PISA study has shown that improvements in mathematical competence across time are related to economic growth within countries. So there's a correlation again between improvements in mathematical competence and economic growth. KPMG, the management consultancy, was commissioned by the UK government to estimate the cost of low numeracy and they estimated that about 2.4 billion per year are lost due to, due to uh, 2.4 billion pounds sterling are lost per year due to low numeracy. So again, suggesting that it's a high economic cost to low numeracy. P 
beyond economics, Numeracy also plays a role in other domains of life, such as healthcare. And there's a growing field called health numeracy, where researchers are showing that the ability of patients and healthcare professionals to use healthcare information is influenced by their numerical abilities. Just consider a nurse on the floor of an emergency room having to read off numbers of an instrument very quickly and translate them, maybe even perform some calculation in order to deliver medication or some other program to the patient. If any mistake is made in those rapid calculations and the recognition of the numbers on the screen of an instrument, that's going to translate into potentially adverse outcomes for the patient. So these statistics show how critical it is to know more about why some children struggle so much to acquire basic numerical and mathematical skills. So I have a second poll question, which is, how familiar are you with developmental dyscalculia? And we can launch the poll now and please indicate on a scale from one to four, with one being not familiar at all and four being very familiar. So if you could indicate that and submit your scores. And then we can go ahead and uh, show the results. Okay. So the majority of you are either not familiar or somewhat familiar. Um, okay, that's very good to know uh, for me, uh, to know what the audience knows about what I'm going to be talking about. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll be much more familiar with developmental dyscalculia. I have another poll question, which is how familiar are you with developmental dyslexia? And again, please, we can open the poll and let you indicate on a scale from one to four, with one being not familiar at all and four being very familiar. And if you could submit those scores, and we can go ahead and uh, close that poll and show the results. Great, so uh, here the results clearly indicate that the audience is more familiar with developmental dyslexia than developmental dyscalculia which is very common of uh, what I experience when I talk about developmental dyscalculia in all sorts of different audiences. There's generally much more familiarity with developmental dyslexia than with developmental dyscalculia. So thank you very much for those, um, for those answers to my poll questions. So I want to start by uh, defining developmental dyscalculia. What is developmental dyscalculia? And I'm going to be reviewing some diagnostic criteria for you that will get us started. One of the most commonly used diagnostic criteria, of course, is the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's now in its fifth edition, published by the American Psychiatric Association. And in the DSM-5, developmental dyscalculia falls under an umbrella term called specific learning disorders. And the definition in the DSM-5 state states that a specific learning disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder of biological origin manifested in learning difficulty and problems in acquiring academic skills markedly below age level and manifested in the early school years lasting for at least six months, not attributed to intellectual disability, developmental disorders, or neurological or motor disorders. I just want to highlight two things here. One of them is that the DSM-5 states it's of biological origins. I'll talk a little bit about what we know with regards to the neuroscience of developmental dyscalculia. And importantly as well, something that wasn't in the DSM-4 is this criteria that it has to last for at least six months. So the direct implication here is that in order to diagnose somebody with a specific learning disorder in mathematics, developmental dyscalculia, one has to look at children repeatedly. And we experience that very much in our research. That there are a lot of so-called false positives if we only diagnose children using one time point. So multiple time points are required in order to be confident that a particular individual has or does not have developmental dyscalculia. It also states that it's not attributed to intellectual disability. So it's a market deficit in one particular area. Furthermore, the DSM-5 
5 then specifies that, uh, that one has to specify whether the specific learning dis disorder is with impairments in reading, which would be developmental dyslexia, with written expression, with impairments in mathematics. And for impairments in mathematics, it further specifies that that could uh, encompass difficulties with things such as number sense, and I'll talk a lot more about number sense, fact and calculation, so the ability to retrieve arithmetic facts and to fluently calculate, and I'll unpack what those deficits are, as well as mathematical reasoning, the ability to more broadly understand the meaning, for example, of arithmetic or the inverse relationship between addition and subtraction. We should also look at the uh, Ontario Ministry of Education definitions for uh, learning disabilities. Uh, so the Ministry of Education defines learning disability as one of a number of neurodevelopmental disorders that persistently and significantly has an impact on the ability to learn and use academic and other skills and that results in difficulties in the development and use of skills in one or more of the following areas, reading, writing, mathematics, and work habit and learning skills. So we can see that there is quite a good alignment between the DSM-5 definition of specific learning disorder and what the Ontario Ministry of Education puts forward as its definition. What about the prevalence of developmental dyscalculia? There are only a limited number of studies that have estimated the prevalence of developmental dyscalculia, but these have estimated that between 5 and 7 percent of the population uh, present with a profile that is consistent with a diagnosis of developmental dyscalculia, dyscalculia. Therefore, the prevalence is actually comparable to dyslexia, but I should note here that we have a lot more prevalent studies of dyslexia than we have of dyscalculia. So I would put more confidence in the prevalence rates for dyslexia than I would for dyscalculia. I should also note at this point that there are other names that are being used to describe what I refer to as developmental dyscalculia, a specific learning disorder in the domain of mathematics. Other researchers and practitioners use terms such as mathematics learning disorder or MLD and mathematics disorder, which was the term previously used by the DSM, the DSM-4, before the DSM-5 switched it to specific learning disorders and further categorize it either as reading, writing, or a math disorder. So it's important to note that these labels are used interchangeably in the research literature. And it's useful here then also to consider what the Ministry of the Ontario Ministry of Education says about terminology. They say that there are different terms used to describe various learning disabilities which can be confusing. Some are medical, some are used in research, some are used for clinical diagnosis, and some are used in an educational setting. Learning disabilities are all neurologically based processing problems. These processing problems can interfere with learning basic skills such as reading, writing, or math. They can also interfere with higher level skills such as organization, time planning, abstract reasoning, long or short term memory, and attention. And I'll certainly talk about the difference between the basic skills and the higher level skills in the context of dyscalculia as well. But here's also um, a, a recognition from the Ministry of Education that there are multiple terms that are often used interchangeably and that can be confusing. Furthermore, the Ministry of Education states that dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, and dyscalculia are terms used in the medical and research fields. These terms may also be more prevalent in the US and in the UK. And in a school setting, students may be considered to have a specific learning disability or learning disabilities that affect academic areas or impact on executive functioning. And a psychologist might diagnose a math learning disability when the learning difficulties are unexpected. Unexpected here refers to the notion that a learning disability occurs despite otherwise normal functioning, which I think is also consistent with the DSM-5 where you, uh, where the definition is that it's um, unexpected given the individual's other neurological and psychological functioning. Here's a table that may help to uh, uh, understand the terms a little bit better. 
Um, so in, in medical or research terminology in the US and the UK, people refer to dyslexia in Ontario, one would refer to that as reading difficulties, dysgraphia, problems with written expression, dyspraxia with speech, and dyscalculia with math. So I hope this overview of the terminology helps you understand how dyscalculia is used and how it's similar to the other terms that are being used to describe specific learning difficulties in the domain of mathematics. Now I've all already alluded to this um, when I talked about the prevalence studies, but there really is a big difference in the ratio of publications on dyslexia uh, compared to dyscalculia. For every 14 publications on dyslexia, there's only one on dyscalculia. So it's an area where we're still trying to understand what causes developmental dyscalculia, what neurological functions are associated with dyscalculia. But we've made some progress, and I want to review that progress for you. So I want to ask the question, what underlies developmental dyscalculia? Having provided a definition and some discussion of terminology and prevalence, it's now time to examine what might be the causal factors of developmental dyscalculia. And uh, until very recently, uh, there was a great focus on a particular set of factors that might contribute to test performance that are very well illustrated here in this figure taken from David Geary's uh, review paper in 1993. David Geary, um, a researcher out of the United States, perhaps the most influential researcher on developmental dyscalculia, or he often refers to it as MLD, math, learning disability. When he conducted his early work, he focused very much on higher level functioning, such as counting knowledge, working memory. Of course, working memory, we need not only to do math, but we also need it in order to do uh, all sorts of things in our everyday lives, so it's not math specific. Procedural skills are not math specific either, and neither is fact retrieval. So all of these were thought to contribute to test performance, and indeed, there was very good evidence suggesting that all of these factors are contributing to test performance. Looking at this slightly differently, here is a table in which he summarizes the cognitive deficits in children with MD, mathematics disability or dyscalculia. And on the left-hand side of the table, you can see the functional deficits and then the uh, potential deficits in supporting systems. So he and his collaborators repeatedly observed that children with developmental dyscalculia use immature counting procedures to solve simple arithmetic problems. And this may arise from immature conceptual understanding of counting, so this emphasis on their understanding of counting. Frequent counting procedure errors, which may reflect immature conceptual understanding of counting and poor working memory. By counting procedures, what he refers to are is the use of counting in order to solve mental arithmetic problems. So it's not enumeration of sets, but it's using counting and using one's fingers to uh, solve mental arithmetic problems. And there's various levels of sophistication of these counting procedures, which I will illustrate on the next slide. The other deficit is the arithmetic fact retrieval deficit, which he attributes to difficulties in lexical access and or difficulties in inhibiting irrelevant associations. So again, the potential deficit in supporting system arises from something, uh, from general mechanisms such as lexical access or the ability to exert inhibitory control. That's thought to be the causal factor in the arithmetic fact deficit, at least um, in the early years that was the position that people had when they looked at the causes of developmental dyscalculia. With regards to uh, fact retrieval and counting, um, one needs to consider how counting procedures change over developmental time. And what we see is that children start out by using their fingers in order to uh, uh, perform elementary calculations, addition problems, for example, but there are various types of levels of sophistication. So, for example, if we are adding 5 plus 3, we could count out both add-ins on our fingers, or we could hold up one hand for 5 and then add the 3, which would be uh, a more sophisticated counting finger-based strategy. And then, of course, children gradually move away from using their fingers to using verbal counting, and again, there are various levels of sophistication. 
and eventually they move to uh, a, a stage where they can decompose problems into multiple parts or simply retrieve the solutions from memory. Children with developmental dyscalculia typically do not undergo the same developmental trajectory with regards to the strategies that they use. And most commonly, children with developmental dyscalculia fail to encode arithmetic facts into long-term memory. They will rely on count-based strategies using their fingers or verbal counting even when their peers have already moved on to retrieving the solutions to simple problems such as 2 plus 3 from memory. So it seems to be at the level of encoding arithmetic problems into long-term memory, there's a fundamental barrier there in children with developmental dyscalculia. So key finding from the early literature is that dyscalculia is associated with a persistent inability to retrieve arithmetic facts from memory, and this is a hallmark of developmental dyscalculia. So this early work was really very productive in helping us to describe the kinds of problems that children have when they encounter simple math problems. However, this literature didn't focus very much on factors that might be specific to number processing. They focused on general difficulties such as working memory, inhibitory control, and not so much what's more domain specific. Are there maybe some deficits that have to do with the way in which children with developmental dyscalculia represent numbers that could lie at the heart of their deficits? More recently, researchers have started to search for more domain-specific factors that may account for developmental dyscalculia. And an analogy that we could draw here is to phonological awareness in the domain of reading that is thought to be one of the key building blocks of building a reading brain. The awareness that sounds decompose into units, that, that language decomposes into units of sounds, as you can measure, for example, with the rhyming task that I've shown there on the right-hand uh, side of your screen where rhyming is a great way to assess whether children have good phonological awareness. And this is thought to be a foundational competence or what we refer to as a readiness skill. One way of thinking about foundational skills is to think about them developmentally. And this is illustrated on this slide here, which is showing the so-called Matthew effect in reading, which was originally described by Keith Stanovich at the Ontario Institutes for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto who, through looking at the literature, observed that those children who lack critical foundational skills, such as phonological awareness early on, have a more flat developmental trajectory. That is, their reading skills don't grow at the same rate as those who have the foundational skills, suggesting that there are cumulative effects of having these foundational competencies. And I think it can be argued that this is, was a real breakthrough in understanding dyslexia because it allowed individuals to look for difficulties that might be already existent before children even encounter print. Just their phonological awareness of the spoken language turned out to be a good predictor of their later, re later reading skills. So the implication here is that early deficits in core competencies lead to subsequent difficulties in acquiring higher level skills, the kinds of skills that Geary looked at, arithmetic and even more complex math skills. So what I want to do now is to look at what might be these core competencies in the domain of, of, of mathematics and number understanding. But before I do so, I just want to ask you a poll question which is just to help me understand whether, whether you're following along with the vocabulary that I'm using, is how clear is the concept of foundational competencies to you? And could you please indicate on a scale from one to four, with one being not clear at all and four being very clear? So we can open that poll. And uh, if you could please uh, submit your answers. Excellent. I think we can probably go ahead and, and close that poll and show the results. Good. So 59% of you say it's very clear, but 22% uh, of you say it's clear, and 17% of you say it's, it's somewhat clear. So let me just try to elaborate this just for uh, a few seconds. I'm going to go back. 
and I think this is the best slide to elaborate it. It's the notion that early competencies that are fundamental to acquiring a particular skill, for example, reading, have a cumulative effect on the subsequent learning of high-level skills. So having poor phonological awareness means that you're going to have difficulties linking letters and speech sounds. If you have difficulties linking letters and speech sound, you're going to have trouble reading letter by letter and later on reading uh, by word forms. So it's the notion that you need to have these building blocks in place in order to set the developmental trajectory off in the right way. So I hope that clarifies things a bit more. So now having sort of illustrated this notion of foundational competencies um, or, 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 or building blocks in developmental dyslexia, what about developmental dyscalculia? We've, we know a lot about their strategy difficulties, about their working memory deficits, but is there something even more deep at the core of their understanding of number that's dysfunctional? And uh, a breakthrough study was published in 2004 by Karen Lundell, Anna Bevan, and Brian Butterworth at University College London, and they really focused in their study on basic numerical capacities. So to give you one example of what they looked at, but first I, I, I need to describe to you the groups that they tested. So they compared four groups of individuals. One group of individuals with developmental dyscalculia, so these were students who had specific difficulties in acquiring basic math skills and scored two standard deviations below the mean on the standard test of math, but were fine in terms of their reading abilities. Dyslexics showed uh, disability in under, in, in, on standardized tests of, of reading achievement, uh, but not math. A double deficit group or a dyslexic dyscalculic group who had both difficulties in reading and in math, and a group of typically developing children who had no market deficits in either reading or math. So their focus on basic number processing uh, led them to design tasks such as this one here. It's a very simple task. You see two numbers and you get asked two possible questions. You might be asked to compare them by, on the basis of their numerical magnitude or on the basis of their physical size. So in the case of 8 and 2, you would have to say 8 for numerically larger and 2 for physically larger. This is an elegant task because you can measure at the same time using the same numbers on the screen the ability of children to access the numerical meaning of the numbers when you ask them to compare them on the basis of numerical magnitude or the physical size, which doesn't require you to have a good understanding of the numerical magnitude. So when they ran this task and compared performance in the number comparison and in the size comparison task, this is what they found. What you see on this figure are reaction times, so the axis uh, is showing you reaction times in milliseconds and the various groups, the control group, the dyslexic, the dyscalculics, and the dyscalculia dyslexia group. And what you can see in the, in the green bars is, um, is the reaction times for the size comparison task. So this is when children were asked to judge which of two numbers is physically larger. And when you compare across the four groups, what you can see is that all of the children were pretty fast at this. And there was critically no differences between the dyscalculics and the dyslexics or the controls and the dyscalculics. All groups performed equally well when they simply had to look at which number is physically larger. However, a massive difference emerged when you asked children now to compare the two numbers, same stimuli, on the basis of the numerical quantity that is represented by the symbols. And what you see here now is that the children with dyscalculia, as well as those with dyscalculia and dyslexia, the two groups towards the right-hand side of the graph, they are, are significantly slower than both the control group and the dyslexia group. What this finding shows is that children with developmental dyscalculia don't have a problem in number recognition. What they have a problem with is retrieving the meaning of the Arabic numerals and comparing the meaning of two Arabic numerals with one another in the context of judging which one is numerically larger. So this was sort of a breakthrough finding because now we had a candidate for a more basic skill that might lie at the core of developmental dyscalculia. So here's just showing you that significantly longer reaction time in the number comparison for the dyscalculic and comorbid group or double deficit group compared to the two control groups, the control group who had no deficits and the dyslexic group. 
So these findings then suggest that dyscalculia is associated or is a deficit to represent and process numerical magnitude in a typical way. And furthermore, this leads to the hypothesis uh, in terms of a foundational competency that lack of understanding numerical magnitude leads to difficulties in learning numerical expressions such as arithmetic problems and maintaining them in memory. So Geary had described these problems and using procedures and maintenance and memory, but that model hadn't really described where those deficits come from. Now there's a candidate that if you have poor representations of quantity and poor representations of the meaning of numerical symbols, then it's going to be very difficult for you to use those symbols in order to perform, for example, calculation problems. And that may then lead to these working memory deficits and the inability to retrieve, to encode arithmetic facts into long-term memory and to retrieve them. And of course, this occurs over developmental time, that the lack of understanding numerical magnitudes early, which over developmental time in a cumulative way leads to these high-level difficulties. So the implication from these findings is that dyscalculia is associated with deficits in processing the meaning of numbers. And another implication is that the risk of dyscalculia can be screened before children learn arithmetic. The early studies were all looking at school-aged children. They were all looking at difficulties that they had with arithmetic. Now we have a candidate mechanism that can be detected much earlier. This is also related uh, to something that the Ontario uh, Ministry of Education says, emphasizes, which is that many students enter school having already shown the precursors or early signs of learning disabilities, such as language delays or difficulties with rhyming or counting. And uh, the Ministry of Education in its mem memorandum states or stresses the importance of early and ongoing screening. And early and ongoing screening requires that we know what to screen for. We need to screen for the precursors of school uh, age level difficulties, so the precursors, for example, of calculation deficits in developmental dyscalculia. In this context, I want to introduce you to the notion that um, we share with other animals and a basic quantitative ability that we refer to as non-symbolic number processing. Non-symbolic number processing simply means that you can guess how many dots are in this array um, and you can do so very rapidly. You might not be 100% correct. It's a more an approximate system of number representation. And it's been found that even very young infants are sensitive to the difference between two dot arrays. You can measure that looking at their looking times, how much time they spend looking at one array of dots versus another. And there's a long line of history of research showing that non-human primates and even salamanders are sensitive to the differences between non-symbolic quantities. Furthermore, we understand a lot about the brain mechanisms underlying non-symbolic number processing and we know that in the parietal cortex that are, there are areas in the so-called intraparietal sulcus that I've highlighted here in yellow on this brain figure that are activated when you engage in non-symbolic number processing. This, of course, leads to the question whether developmental dyscalculia is characterized by a core deficit in non-symbolic number processing. And this is really a very important question because if indeed developmental dyscalculia is characterized by a deficit in non-symbolic number processing, then maybe it means that we're born with developmental dyscalculia. So this is a key question in the field. There are, of course, two possibilities. One of them is that you have impaired non-symbolic number processing, which is indicated by this dot array, uh, which leads to deficits in symbolic number processing, which is the so-called number module deficit hypothesis. The other hypothesis is that perhaps it's not so much that you're born with a deficit in non-symbolic number processing, but that children with developmental dyscalculia have difficulties in linking numerical symbols such as number words and Arabic numerals to these pre-existing non-symbolic approximate representations of number. I want to ex briefly explore the evidence for these two hypotheses with you. Um, but first of all, I want to ask you a poll question so that I can get an understanding for how clear 
my description was. And what I want to ask you is how clear is the distinction between number module deficit and symbolic access deficit to you? And please indicate this on a scale from one to four, with one being not at all and four being very clear. So if, we, if you could go ahead and vote, please. And uh, if we could take a look at the results. Okay, so somewhat clear is the majority, so I think I'm just going to um, uh, briefly go over it. I, I don't have much time to, to, to fully uh, reiterate what I just said. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a very simple, uh, two simple possibilities. So we share with other animals a basic non-symbolic uh, sense of quantity. Some people refer to this as number sense. We can discriminate between daughter race, so can non-human primates, and we can detect that in very young babies. Now, it might be that developmental dyscalculia is due to a deficit of this non-symbolic number processing system that then leads to difficulties in acquiring symbols, such as Arabic numerals or number words. But it could also be, which is what the symbol, symbolic access deficit hypothesizes, that the difficulty is not so much that you're born with an impairment in non-symbolic number processing, but that children with developmental dyscalculia have difficulties making symbols meaningful, linking them to representations of quantity. So I hope that's made it a little bit clearer. So I want to now look at evidence for the number module deficit in developmental dyscalculia, and then also evidence for the, uh, for the symbol access deficit model. There was an influential paper published in 2011 by Michelle Mazzocco, Lisa Feigenson, and Justin Halberta from Johns Hopkins University entitled Impaired Acuity of the Approximate Number System Underlies Mathematics Learning Disability or Dyscalculia. Complicated title, but the study is not as complicated as the title might make it sound. This was based on a longitudinal study conducted by Michelle Mazzocco, uh, and the children were tested when they were in grade nine, but they had scores available for 10 years before then. And uh, from this longitudinal study, uh, Michelle Mazzocco and our colleagues were able to identify 10 children with uh, math learning disability or dyscalculia who had very profound difficulties in math. And they had, had demonstrated those profound difficulties in math, 10th percentile or below, for 10 years. Then there was a group of low achieving children who were slightly better, so not as impaired, but still impaired. 37 typically achieving children, and 15 high achieving children. So you've got the full range of math performance. The question now is, does non-symbolic number processing differentiate between these groups? They use a very simple task. You see a display of yellow and blue dots, and you have to indicate whether there are more blue or more yellow dots. And these flash very quickly, so you have to make a rough judgment using your intuitive sense of non-symbolic numerical quantity. What they found was they used a measure called Weber fraction, which is a measure of how accurate you are at, uh, at making these discriminations. And a higher Weber fraction means poorer performance. And what you can see is that the group with those very specific deficits, the MLD group, did show a, a higher Weber fraction. They did show poorer acuity in this non-symbolic number discrimination task than all the other groups. So this is supportive of this notion that math learning disability or dyscalculia is associated with this core deficit in non-symbolic number processing. However, there's also evidence for the symbolic axis deficit in developmental dyscalculia. Uh, I'm just reviewing a selection of paper because I don't want to bore you with paper after paper, but here's a paper by Bertha Smith and Camilla Gilmore and what they did is they also had various groups of individuals, one group of children with MLD or dyscalculia, uh, low achieving group, and a typically achieving group. And they tested these individuals' ability to both perform symbolic, so comparing which of two numbers is larger, digits is larger, or which of two dot arrays is larger, which would be the non-symbolic task. And what they found was that when you looked at the symbolic comparison performance that's on the left-hand side of your screen, the three bars representing in white the uh, dyscalculia group, in uh, the light gray the low achieving group, and the slightly darker gray the typically achieving group. This is reaction time. And what you can see is their group differences for symbolic 
but not for non-symbolic. So this is evidence in support of this notion that it's not so much the difficulties with dot discrimination, but it's the difficulty with discriminating between Arabic numerals that lies at the core of developmental dyscalculia. The implication is, and I told you at the very beginning of my webinar, that we are still very much in the beginning of understanding developmental dyscalculia, that the data are controversial and it's unclear whether it's a deficit in non-symbolic or symbolic number processing. At this point, I would say that I believe it's very much possible that you have various types of dyscalculia, with some being associated with non-symbolic number processing and some being associated with symbolic number processing. And in future, we need to probably differentiate more between these various subtypes. And I'll talk about this notion uh, at the end as well. So to give you an interim summary, Developmental dyscalculia is associated with impairments in domain general competencies, working memory, processing speed, the kinds of things that David Geary investigated in the early 90s, looking at what are their arithmetic deficits. Working memory, it's been found that especially visuospatial working memory is impaired. Retrieval of arithmetic facts, or the difficulty in retrieving, in encoding, and subsequently retrieving arithmetic facts is a hallmark of developmental dyscalculia. But more recent work that I've just reviewed for you also shows domain-specific deficits in foundational competencies. Symbolic and non-symbolic number seems to be impaired. It's unclear which is stronger, but in general, when one looks across the evidence, most of the evidence is in support of the access deficit hypothesis. But as I've just said, it might be that there are multiple subtypes of developmental dyscalculia. So the implication from this is, I think we need to consider both domain general and domain specific deficits, and critically we need to understand how they interact over developmental time. It's not either or maybe, it's more how are they related. If you have a poor representation of number, and if you cannot easily access the semantic meaning of numerical symbols, that's going to impair your ability to calculate, and that is subsequently going to impair your ability to perform higher level problem solving, algebra, and so forth. Um, so we need to think about this developmentally, the early origins and how they cumulatively lead to deficits. Relating this back to the recommendations by the Ontario Ministry of Education, in their Memorandum 8, they encourage school boards to use a multidisciplinary approach to assessing and identifying learning disabilities. And I believe that's fundamental, that one uses both domain-specific and domain-general measures. The domain-specific measures are not yet commonly available, but we have a free screening tool at www.numeracyscreener.org that you might want to look at. It's not a diagnostic tool, but at least it provides perhaps some indication of difficulties, which then need to be more thoroughly followed up. So to sort of review where, we, where we've been, where we've come from, and where we are now, I want to contrast the historical model of developmental dyscalculia, which is this one, which is very much emphasizing these domain general competencies, to a more modern model of developmental dyscalculia uh, published by Brian Butterworth and colleagues in science, where now you're seeing that um, we are looking at developmental dyscalculia um, at multiple levels of analysis. We consider the behavioral levels, but then we consider the cognitive levels that in include things such as concepts, principles, procedures, spatial abilities, but also the critical role of numerosity or numerical magnitude representation. And then even at the biological level and the genetic the biological level, the brain level, and the genetics level. I haven't included too much on that in this talk, um, uh, uh, but if you're interested in learning more about that, yeah, you can send me an email and I can send you some papers on the more neurobiological basis of developmental dyscalculia. But we've certainly come a long way, and we're starting to understand how all these different subcomponents interact with one another. Related to this, it's important to recognize and I think I emphasized that before, that there's no single cause of developmental dyscalculia, but there are multiple components. It's a highly complex specific learning disorder. This developmental dyscalculia, therefore, is a heterogeneous specific learning disorder. And indeed, in a recent uh, uh, analysis, um, together with colleagues at the University of Maastricht, 
we used cluster analyses in a relatively large group of children with developmental dyscalculia to differentiate between different uh, subgroups. And we found six different clusters, some children who showed very strong impairment in symbolic number processing that was actually the strongest impairment, but other children who had more working memory impairments, some children who found it very difficult to place numbers on a number line, maybe having a spatial representational problem there as well. So uh, there's no single cause. The hope for the future is that we can empirically use these cluster analyses and use them to tailor specific uh, diagnostic approaches and intervention approaches to subgroups. I think that is very much the way that research is moving now. It's going to take some time, but we need to take individual differences into account. So the implication there is there is not one developmental dyscalculia, but many, and there are many different causes. This also leads me to an important topic, which is the topic of comorbidity. So developmental dyscalculia is often not isolated. So you do find some children who only have that math deficit, but many have other difficulties, such as developmental dyslexia. Many studies have shown that children who have developmental dyscalculia often also have reading difficulties, or they have attentional hyperactivity disorders, uh, or other uh, generalized problems with executive functioning, for example. Interestingly, there is yet to be any clear evidence for a common cause when it comes to the relationship between developmental dyslexia and developmental dyscalculia. That has not been found yet. People have looked for common causes such as a general symbol processing deficit does not turn out to explain the comorbidity. So more studies currently point to disorders within, that exist within the same individuals but have separate causes. Uh, but I would say watch this space. There's a lot more research to be done on this. And I think neuroscientific research can also be very informative here. But we do know from neuroscience that the networks of, that are engaged by math and reading, some nodes are overlapping, but many are quite different as well. So it is possible that you can have two specific learning disorders that actually have different uh, causal pathways. So the implication here is that multiple specific learning difficulties may exist within the same child but they are not necessarily linked. I think that's very important. Uh, one interesting question that we want to pursue is, for example, does reading intervention improve math, and does math intervention improve reading? So that's a question we're looking to pursue in the future, because perhaps through examining the intervention effects, we get to understand more about the commonality and the differences between the disorders. I now want to finally turn to some practical suggestion. Um, I have to preface this with saying that I am uh, a scientist uh, um, and my expertise is in basic research, but I do, of course, think about how we can translate the work that we do on dyscalculia and math learning more generally into uh, concrete strategies. So one of the things that I would like to emphasize is that when thinking about how to help children with developmental dyscalculia, it's critical to think developmentally. That may sound very straightforward, but it does require one to ask questions about what might be some of the foundational skills that this child is lacking. So if they show poor attention skills in math, maybe it's not because they've got attention problems, but maybe it's because they cannot deal with the representation of numbers. And what building blocks need to be rebuilt? So thinking developmentally and thinking about how uh, a given mathematical competency that one is trying to teach um, is reliant on, on, uh, on processes that were acquired earlier, I think, can be very helpful. A developmental uh, perspective also means that we can detect risk factors earlier. There's really no need to wait until children learn arithmetic in order to understand who might be at risk of having difficulties in acquiring arithmetic uh, and who might be just fine. And we can test the foundational skills, such as the ability to perform number comparison or the ability to match numerals to sets. And we can train children on foundational skills before they learn arithmetic. We are running some pilot studies on uh, some potential tools to train foundational skills in senior kindergarten before children enter the, the formal classroom 
uh, and before they acquire or before they introduce very formally uh, to arithmetic. So uh, much like in reading where we can emphasize phonological awareness skills in pre-readers, we can emphasize these foundational skills in math learners as well. Research on basic number processing deficits suggests that the following are important. So working on symbolic, non-symbolic mappings. What I mean by that is helping children understand that three dots is the same as the number word three, as the Arabic numeral three is three uh, books on a table, as three fish in an aquarium. Being able to understand these multiple representations of the same numerical quantity is something quite challenging. We as adults think it's quite easy, but Developmentally, it's quite an abstract understanding that we need to develop because number is an abstract qu uh, quality of sets. Developing fluency with the use of numerals through exercises such as numeral naming but also numeral comparison. Working with number lines has been found to be extremely beneficial. But Robert Siegler at Carnegie Mellon University has done some beautiful work showing how playing simple board games helps children in their spatial understanding of number and in the numerical relationships between numbers. Making number salient through number talk, through helping children to carve out the worlds that they're in, in terms of numerical quantities and the relationships between them, I think can be very important as well. For arithmetic, I would say one of the things that we have r really understood well about developmental dyscalculia is that very few of them get to a stage where they can recall arithmetic facts. So perhaps it's more on working on improving the counting strategies that they use, uh, working to move away from finger counting to verbal counting, but gradually teaching more efficient strategies that do not require retrieval and using both manipulative and symbols to aid the understanding of arithmetic. So I want to summarize and conclude and then I look forward to taking your question. I hope that uh, I've shown you that developmental dyscalculia is a specific learning disability that affects numerical and mathematical skills. The prevalence is between five and 7%, however, take into account my caveat about the number of, of good uh, prevalence studies to date. With regards to the causes of, and symptoms of developmental dyscalculia, what we know is that they have persistent difficulties in encoding arithmetic facts into memory. They use non-retrieval strategies when other children have started retrieving. They also have, and this is the revelation of more recent research, problems with basic number processing with these foundational skills, with their understanding of number symbols and their understanding of non-symbolic quantities such as dot arrays or groups of objects or numbers of sounds is, is atypical, suggesting perhaps that uh, there is a component, a very biologically basic component to this deficit in some individuals. Uh, in our research, uh, uh, we are finding that what they struggle with most is understanding numerical symbols and using these fluently. Intervention strategies, I believe, need to be developmentally appropriate and they need to build on foundational skills and recognize that math is a cumulative skill and that dyscalculics are perhaps arrested at some point in their development and therefore couldn't pick up the subsequent high-level skills. Um, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, I thought I had a thank you very much for your attention slide here, but I don't. So I'll, I'll just say thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to uh, interacting with you in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ansari, for presenting such an interesting and important topic to all of our participants today. If anyone has any questions, you can click the raise hand button on your control panel and you will be unmuted to ask a live question to Dr. Ansari. Or you're also welcome to type your question into the chat box, chat box on your dashboard and I will read the question out loud. Um, before we get started with the Q&A session, I just wanted to make a quick note that a couple of you have requested the web address that Dr. Ansari referenced over the course of his presentation, and we will make sure that this gets sent out to you with the post-webinar email. So I have a couple of questions lined up for you, Dr. Ansari. Mm -hmm. So the first one um, is asking if you might have any suggestion for educational apps or software 
other than a calculator or math pad plus that could be purchased um, as assistive technology for math through school board funds? Um, so, so this this would be actual um, sort of electronic application. Is that what the question is referring to? Yes, like something for an iPad or a tablet device. So, um, one of the issues. So, I I have some recommendations. Um, there is, but I I have to say first of all, I have to say that one of the really unfortunate things is that there are very few. Um, programs for helping children with developmental dyscalculia that have been rigorously evaluated using, you know, randomized controlled trials. So what I'm going to say are just some tools that I have found to be interesting, but I cannot say that they, I cannot yet say that there's good evidence in support of, of their efficacy. So one of them is actually a free um, free tool called Native Numbers that's available in the App Store that's currently only available for iPad. And we are currently working with the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board in a small pilot study to examine the efficacy of this application. It's a, it's a program that I like because it builds very much on foundational skills and tries to help children get a more fluent understanding of quantities and their relations and their orders. It also works on counting. Um, so I, 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 I like it, but you know, the researcher in me says one should be cautious because we don't yet have good evidence that it works. But hopefully in the next few months we'll be able to uh, report more on that, whether it indeed is a benefit or not. Okay, great. Um, is that designed for a specific age group, just to clarify? Yes, that would be for uh, JKK and maybe grade one. Okay, perfect. Um, I have a couple of questions that I think sort of tie together. So I'm going to ask this as a two-part question. Um, the first part of the question is, do children with dyscalculia have a lower ability to succeed in math? So, for example, should they be enrolled in applied level math versus university or college level math? That's, that's a tricky question. I think it depends on the case by case basis. So, discul some dyscalculics struggle with arithmetic but are actually very good with things like geometry. Um, math is such a, you know, there are so many components to math that I think it would be important to, to make sure to assess not just arithmetic but other skills in order to determine what a dyscalculic may struggle with and what, what they may actually not struggle with. So I think it's difficult to, to a priori without having looked at the individual and their profile of strength and weaknesses to make that decision. But many dyscalculics, you know, will continue to have problems also in university math. And one of the one of the things that I find really surprising in this day and age is that at universities, you know, we don't have special provisions for or accommodations for individuals with developmental dys dyscalculia. We have them for dyslexia, but not for math problems. So the second part of the question kind of leads into that, um, and it's a question that asks if you have any specific advice for the parent of a child or even for the child themselves um, who has interest in pursuing the sciences in university but their math difficulties may pose a hindrance to succeeding with the required math courses in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I would. I would say you've got to talk to your academic counselor. You know, I don't know how it works in high school but at the university level, and seek seek accommodations. Um, I think academic counselors are maybe not so familiar with developmental dyscalculia, so bringing them research literature on that, making that clear, and finding ways to work around that. I don't think that developmental dyscalculia is an absolute barrier to, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers. I believe that some dyscalculics just have real difficulties in learning how to calculate, but other skills will be fine, and they can use, you know, technologies such as calculators to, to overcome that. Um, 
we just need more societal awareness of it, just like we now have for dyslexia. And then I think all of these things will fall into place, and we will we will get more recognition of these individuals and their needs. So I, I'm afraid that I can't give very specific practical suggestions, but I think coming armed with a research body on it and, and demonstrating that it's real, because some people you know, maybe don't think it's real, uh, it, it's going to be very important. Thanks, Daniel. I think that's a great answer. Uh, we see people with dyslexia who are, are writers all the time, so I think that's great to hear. Exactly. Um, we do actually have a live question, so I'm going to ask Jason, are you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, I can hear ahead. you. Yes, okay, great. I can hear you. Go ahead. Um, hi, Daniel. So you mentioned there is a screening tool. Um, the screening tool, is it um, going to ask specific questions geared toward the two deficit areas you mentioned, or is it more just for the foundational skills that they might be lacking as an overview of what we might need to kind of um, provide for the student if they're struggling in math? Uh, thank you, Jason, for that question. So it's, it's kind of both. So the screening tool uh, that we've developed is, first of all, I, I really have to preface that it's not a diagnostic tool at all. It's just a screener. It asks children to perform as quickly and as accurately as they can, a series of number comparisons, both symbolically and non-symbolically. So you will get, and then you can enter the scores into our website and get a percentile rank. This is all completely free. Um, and you uh, get a percentile rank for both symbolic and non-symbolic. So you could differentiate between somebody who screens at being, you know, more, having more difficulties with symbolic than non-symbolic. But we are also developing a number of other screeners and hopefully eventually diagnostic tools that will be more comprehensive because this screener really just assess that one skill, the comparison skill, and we're now also discovering that things such as understanding the ordered sequence of numbers is very important. And so we're, we're working on more screening tools which we'll also release through that website when we have enough data to do so. Okay, great, Jason. I hope that answered your question. Um, our next question is coming from Rob, and he would like to know if, uh, Dr. Sorry, he wants to know if you feel that dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, and dyscalculia should be viewed as a spectrum of learning disabilities. That's a that's an excellent question. Um, you know, this is the this is the the sort of debate in, in psychiatry is categorical or spectrum-based. Hans Einzing, the famous psychologist, argued for what I think you are referring to, a more spectrum-based. I do believe that, that, there is, uh, that there is a spectrum given the high comorbidity. Um, for, of course, diagnostic purposes, um, it can be more useful to refer to specific learning difficulties. But we need to continually work on understanding the relationships between these various disorders, not just correlationally, but causally. Uh, that is very important, I think. OK, great. Um, thank you. Our next question is from Monica. She wants to know if there is a scope and sequence chart available for the foundation skills. Um, there, there are various literature reviews, you know, people are still differing on, on the sequence of acquisition. Um, but if you, if you want to send me an email, um, daniel.ansari at uwo.ca, I can send you some of the, the research review papers that we have. Um, so that I wouldn't say there's one consensus view on that yet. Okay, so Monica, hopefully you got his email address, but you can email us as well if, uh, if you have any additional questions, if you missed that. Um, just a few more questions. Uh, this question is from Allison. She would like to know if you have any suggestions for how you intervene with high school students, say grade 9 or 10, who don't have this, the foundational skills that you were talking about. Um, so, for example, she's wondering if jump math might be 
a good math program to make use of? Um, I get asked this question all the time, and it's such an important question. I don't have a very good answer for it. Um, I do believe that going back to some of the foundational skills and just making sure that children at that level have them is important. Uh, working on alternative strategies is important. With regards to jump math, um, that could be interesting, but again, we have to recognize that as of today, there is no empirical evidence that unequivocally shows the efficacy of jump math. So we, we have to await that. Um, and we also have to await whether it's very good for children with specific learning profiles. That's the possibility. Um, I have, you know, my work concentrates on early grades, so I haven't worked very much with children in the, in the upper grades, but that will be, is, an, is a very important uh, topic, I think, uh, for future research, and that research in and of itself will hopefully also inform the kind of remediation strategies that one might uh, adopt. I think in those, uh, in those upper grades, there's one topic that I didn't have the time to speak about, but maybe I can just talk about it just very briefly, is we also need to work on the emotional side, the math anxiety side, um, and, and how children view themselves as math learners, what kind of mindset they have about math. And I think especially in the higher grades, you know, work by Carol Dweck and others has shown that math skills start to decline and students start, some students start to adopt a very fixed mindset about their math abilities. So I think in the adolescent years we also don't, don't just need to work at the cognitive level, but also at the emotional level and how learners appraise themselves. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll just go with the one last question that I have right in front of me here. And this question comes from Jennifer, and she would like to know uh, if there are any strengths that students could access, such as spatial reasoning. And I think just to add a little bit of clarity to the question, I think she's meaning in order to compensate for some of the math difficulties that they might be experiencing. Great question. Um, Spatial skills tend to be quite impaired in children's development of this function. They're spatial working memory skills. So I would argue that it's probably more at the at the verbal side uh, where children can use compensatory uh, mechanisms. I think, and I think you know, recognizing as well that maybe the development of strategies is more important than the development of encoding facts into memory for these students can be important and, and using that as a compensatory strategy for this clear deficit in the inability to encode and retrieve arithmetic facts. But, uh, I think you, you raise a really important point that we need to look at not just what do they perform poorly at but what other skills might, be, might they be using to overcome their difficulties. I, for my PhD, I worked on children with Williams syndrome, who uh, genetic developmental disorder, and they also have math difficulties, uh, but they have a relative strength in language, and I found some evidence that they could use their linguistic strength to overcome some of their nonverbal difficulties. So, thank you for that question. That's a very important future frontier. Okay, so I think that that's all the time that we have for today. So we're going to end our question and answer session at this time, but if you have any further questions, you can email us at info at ldxschool.ca. And Daniel, I believe you also said that they could email you directly at daniel.ansari at uwo.ca. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. And we will ensure either way that all of your questions get answered. Perfect. Just a couple of notes before we sign off for the, for the afternoon. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and we would also love it if you would come out and see him as our keynote speaker at LD at Schools Educators Institute in August. This event is a bilingual conference that focuses on the teaching and, and learning of students with learning disabilities, and this year will be held on August 25th and 26th at the Hilton Mississauga Meadowvale in Mississauga. Presenters will include experts and educators in the field of LDs from across Canada, including Dr. Ansari, and she will be giving our opening keynote on August 25th. 
As a delegate attending the Educators Institute, you will be provided with new perspectives and knowledge in the field of learning disabilities, which is based on current research and practical information on effective assessment and instructional strategies, including technology. All Ontario educators who work with students with LDs are encouraged to attend. If you would like more information about the event, you can visit the LD at School website and or type in the link shown at the bottom of the screen. We'd also like to invite you to join us uh, at our upcoming webinar on Tuesday, May 12th. Dr. Colin King, a psychologist and the acting coordinator of psychological services in the Thames Valley District School Board, will be presenting a webinar on the topic of support, supporting social and emotional development of students with LDs. More registration information will be available on the LD at School website next week. And if you would like to be kept up to date with other upcoming events, such as our free webinars, please subscribe to LD at School's bi-weekly newsletter. And you can do this on the LD at School homepage by entering your email in the sign-up box located on the bottom of the page. You can also be kept up to date about what's happening with us by following LD at School on Twitter. And our Twitter handle is at LDAT School. And finally, on behalf of the LD at School team, I would once again like to thank Dr. Ansari for his presentation and to thank all of our participants for joining us. Please remember that we will be sending out presentation slides as well as a short survey following today's webinar. The feedback we receive through this survey provides us with important information for producing future webinars. Also remember that we will be sending out an AODA compliant link to this recorded webinar in approximately three weeks. Thank you again for participating, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.